I think that there were two reasons why I was drawn towards architecture. The one was that my mother had been a frustrated artist and took me to galleries. And we lived in Leicester, which at the time, the latter part of the Second World War, it had a lot of cultural activities, opera, symphony concerts, galleries, and I went to all of them. And the other thing was my father was an army officer who had contrived to stay in England. He'd already fought in the First World War, but he stayed in England and he was called a quartering commandant of that part of the Midlands. And I was taken as a little tiny kid, four-year-old, whatever, to see grand houses, which the army were then taking for paratroops and tanks and so on. So I was put in tanks and put in gliders and all sorts of things because my dad was a colonel. And, and I, uh, I, I think that was going into my head. And then there was a very particular thing, which was we often had tea or had to visit places and there would be an inevitable sort of hotel which would have an etching of the town, you know, it might be Nottingham from the southeast or Leicester from the southwest or wherever. And I was fascinated by these usually horizontal engravings with the houses and the church and the cathedral, you know, the, the castle and the bridge over the river. And I began to draw my own in bit, exercise books and bits of paper. And I would invent towns, you know, a church and a castle and a bridge. And, a, and then I would somehow, God knows how this started, I'd start to put modern, modern architecture. I was fascinated, even as a six, seven, eight-year-old, by modern. I started to read books about architecture, maybe around the age of 11. And um, so it became formalized. Now, the only odd thing, I think, in the context of this event now, is that I was really not a good drawer. I wasn't the worst in the class, but I was by no means ever the best in the class, whatever class I was. Even in the little architecture school, there were five or six people who could draw better than me. They could certainly draw trees and birds and, you know, all that stuff. I was a rather painful drawer. It did improve in the art school because there were some very good people that we were attached to who were really drawers, and, and we had a lot of colour theory, lots of class of colour theory, because they wanted to use the resource of the art school for this little bunch of architects. So in that sense, my drawing improved, but still it was never fluent. I'm still not fluent. I, if you were watching me drawing, then I'm using a straight edge. I'm using aids. I got lots of tricks of the trade by now. Um, and then, of course, um, the question was, because I was not a natural drawer, I realized that I was determined to communicate ideas. I was arrogant enough to say, I'm sorry, I'm not just going to sit at the back of the process and specify door handles. I am going to be a creative architect somehow or other. And so you just bloody well had to do it like an artisan. I was always surrounded by people who could draw better than me. And the other thing is to do with sketching. I'm not, you know, all the time curators or other people say, can we see some sketches? Do you have sketches? Do we, we want to exhibit your sketches before? And the thing is bullshit because I don't do very many sketches. I can do organizational diagrams. And this is the thing in architecture, which I think a lot of people outside the game don't realize that a lot of really significant architects, Louis Kahn, James Sterling, these sort of people, do very good scribbles. And I find I can do quite attractive scribbles, but they are not sketches. They are organizational diagrams. This thing will go there, and you do a sort of circle for the sun and a kind of wobbly line for a hill. And yeah, it's fair offend. The Norwegian's another person I knew well did amazing drawing, but very, very minimal. Our 
does the hand know more than the brain? The hand is so closely related to the brain and over many decades, the brain knows what the hand finds agreeable to do. And over many decades, the hand knows what it needs support. But from it come certain, there's certain pieces where you say, ah, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll put it, in, I use the expression sometimes, putting it in the back pocket. Come up with something that goes into your mental back pocket. Ten years later, you're actually working on something real. And it mysteriously comes out of the back pocket. Perhaps slightly, you don't necessarily, if, if you like certain bits, you sort of keep them in your head. And maybe it will, a piece of it will come out. And I think, if I can make a general point, I think that more than I would like to admit that, that one's drawings are quotational. You know, one, they purport to be original. They purport to be dealing only with what interests me in terms of language and so on. But actually, they're highly quotational. And I find when I'm designing a building, I, or much more than in early days, I, I'm always thinking scenarios into them. I even draw cartoons of what people might be doing. So that when we did the architecture school in Australia, I did two dozen cartoons of people, funny things that happen in architecture schools. Now that was easy because I'd already spent 40 years in architecture schools. So the, the building became very much to do with, with anecdotes. What happens when the student who's been on the beach is coming in and suddenly seen by the head of the school? What happens to the couple who are kissing under the awning of the deck? What happens to the person who's having a crit being observed but can't see the observer? These sorts of things. What happens to the pompous guy giving a, a lecture? And I was, I'm fascinated by feeding, because I think if you teach for a very long time, you become very interested in people. And then you don't see a building in the abstract. You see it as somebody coming in the door and then having to do that, and then there's something funny going on in the corner, and the, the guy's putting the bicycle under the staircase. But if you marry that with being interested in the elements and the surfaces and so on, then I think that's, to me, what architecture is about. I'm not an abstractionist. I really... Of all the people I know, I'm the least able to be abstract. I think, for me, the importance of drawing to architecture is, is almost fundamental. I, and I think even hand drawing, because this is like, could be considered a Luddite's position, because I can't draw on a computer. I sit doing lots of things on it, but I can't draw on it. And I notice that sometimes the computer enables you to do something very easily and quickly. And there's this argument that can be made, and I'm not sure whether I'm with this argument or against it, but it interests me that the struggle to depict something gives you time to think into it. I know this used to happen when I was a young architect and I had to draw staircases, and they were a nightmare, even, you know, I was always getting them wrong. <laughs> Spiral staircases, particularly. But the struggle to deal with the staircase, the struggle then to take a building around a corner, I think the business of a building going around a corner is really a fundamental study. I've done sometimes lectures about this sort of thing. But the, for the material and the mannerism and the light and shade and the whole substance of a building to turn a corner is a dramatic thing and a wonderful thing if you do it well. What am I trying to say with the drawing? Am I trying to talk about 
transparency? Am I trying to talk about odd positioning? Am I trying to talk about the language of form or of surface? I think if I were to make a self-analysis of what has been and is my primary interest in architecture, it is to expand the language. When you draw, and you can decide upon almost anything. You know, I mean, often, I mean, there's one image of something, or one idea that I've had for years and years and years, which is how to make a building that can go from solid to transparent without a window, meaning, I even call it the discussion of the tyranny of the window, that most architectures, you make a box and then you put holes in it and then you piss around with the edge of the hole making it look fancy or not making it look fancy. But that's very primitive. I want to do a building that goes from solid to slightly per permeable and then translucent, more translucent, completely transparent and then back again. And I occasionally have done drawings of this and in even one building uh, the Graz Kunsthaus, which I do with Colin Fournier, we had one little bit of the building where we did a little piece of this and then the city say, hey, you're spending too much money. Mm. <laughs> cut, cut it out. Mm. But so there's been one little faint attempt to do this, but it's still one of my wish dreams. There's a big misunderstanding on the part of observers about my work or similar work to, to bring in the issue of utopian. I don't think any of the work is utopian. Now that you might think, oh, he's crazy. Of course it is utopian. But I think the notion of utopia, the notion of the ideal perfect objective is not in my mind. I think that a lot of these drawings are buildable. They may not be 100% buildable, but they are more buildable than they're unbuildable. So what I'm saying is, to answer the question, is it utopic? No, it's not utopian. I, I, I even, I, I sort of balk at the idea. If it's, you, you see, what happens is, the critical observer will say, ah, that stuff is utopian. What we do down the road is real. And it delights me to say that we did build the Kunsthaus in Graz, which could have been one of these drawings. But it's there. You can go inside it. It's still working 20 years down the line. And agreeably. And so then I say, hey, hold it. If you say that this stuff is utopian, what about Graz? It's built. If you can build Graz, ha-ha, you guys, you can build 80% of this stuff. It's just that you, by, by the critics and the regular people saying it's utopian, you put it aside, you put it into a kind of, uh, you put it into a, a pigeonhole that says, oh, those sort of architects are utopian. And we architects are normal. So that the delight I get out of doing some buildings is to say, Screw you, it can be built. So then I say, I do not want to be a utopian architect. I'm not interested in utopia. I'm interested in architecture. I'm interested in the drawings contributing towards the discussion and language of architecture. And thank you very much, I wouldn't mind building some of it.